Eva Huimenta. Good morning, everyone. Um, I'm very excited to be here in a country that uh, has more saunas than people because I love saunas. Um, and apparently, you guys must also like saunas. Today, my talk is going to focus much on some of the health benefits uh, that saunas have on the brain and also on overall longevity. Um, I'm also going to dive a little bit into cold water and uh, how cold water can also affect the brain uh, as well as metabolism um, and other uh, health benefits as well. But today my talk is going to begin with a personal story about uh, stress. So there's good stress and there's bad stress. Um, for me, when I was a graduate student um, getting my PhD, uh, I was experiencing a combination of both good and bad stress. The good stress was I was learning how to be a scientist. I was learning tools and techniques um, to answer interesting scienti scientific questions that I had. Um, and that was good. I was adapting to that stress. But there's also uh, bad stress that I experienced in graduate school, and that came along with many different exams, um, multiple exams, failed experiments, experiments that would take me three months to set up and would fail, and 16-hour experiments I had to perform again and again and again. And I was not adapting to that stress. I was experiencing a sense of, at times, crippling anxiety which I think everyone in this room has probably experienced some so form of anxiety uh, in, their, in their lives before, so we can all relate to that. Um, so I was not adapting to that stress, and it was having negative effects on my health. Um, I was getting poor sleep. So I decided to try to counter that stress, uh, bad stress, with good stress. And good stress is a type of stress that is a short-term stressor on the body, something that is slightly stressful, that activates all these genetic pathways that are hard encoded in our genes that are able to deal with stress. And so what ends up happening is that tiny bit of short-term stressor ends up not only compensating for that stress, but you end up having a net resilience effect. Uh, and this is often referred to as hormesis, so you have a little tiny bit of stress, and it activates all these stress response pathways. The reason we have these stress response genetic pathways is because life itself is stressful. Just normal living, normal breathing and oxygen and eating food you know, causes stress on our body. We, we are making you know, metabolic byproducts, reactive oxygen species, like every second it's happening right now as I talk. So our, our, we're able to heal, uh, handle this, these types of stresses with you know, various genetic pathways. But when you, when you can flip that switch on to those genetic pathways with something that's just slightly stressful on the body, something like exercise, then you have this net resilience effect and you adapt to that stress and you're able to handle it um, better. And not only are you able to handle that stress better, but you become better. It all, it, additionally, um, another type of hormetic stressor is actually heat stress. So something like the sauna, um, which is a you know, heat stress, that's something that I started to do in graduate school. So I lived across the street from a gym. It had a sauna. I started using it every day. And uh, I was using it quite frequently, probably about five days a week. And I started to notice that I felt really good. Like, my mood was noticeably enhanced. And I also was able to handle stress better, and my anxiety was down. And I was trying to figure out what was going on in my brain. Like, how was the sauna affecting my brain, because it was. I, it was very, very obvious to me. So I decided to dive into the literature and try to figure that out. So most people are familiar with the feel-good endorphin. What you may not be familiar with is the counter to that, dynorphin. And dynorphin is activated upon heat stress. And the reason for that is because dynorphin cools the body down. Well, dynorphin is the counter to endorphin because it makes you feel uncomfortable and dysphoric. So heat stress will release dynorphin from a presynaptic neuron. And that dynorphin will then bind to another receptor called the kappa opioid receptor. And when that happens, that's when you begin to feel uncomfortable and dysphoric. And that's the feeling you usually feel when you're hot and you're in the, sitting in the sauna or you're, you just you feel bad and you're like, oh, I just want to get out, it's too hot. Or you're exercising really you know, vigorously and you're, you're feeling hot and you want to stop. That's dynorphin. That's what's making you feel uncomfortable. 
You may be thinking to yourself, well, I thought you said you felt really good. What are you talking about here? Well, this is where it gets really interesting because this pathway, this mechanistic pathway that is the, this is a thermal regulatory control pathway. You make dynorphin to cool your body down, but you also feel uncomfortable. What happens is this actually changes the way your brain responds to the feel-good endorphins. So endorphins bind to another type of receptor called the mu opioid receptor. And when dynorphin is released and you feel uncomfortable, this causes mu opioid receptors to make more of them and it sensitizes them to endorphin. So that means the next time that you make endorphin, whether that's from exercise or the sauna, because it also make, uh, causes you to release endorphin, or if it's you know, from laughter or giving someone a hug, whatever it is that's causing you to release endorphin, you are going to feel so much better because that endorphin is gonna bind to those receptors that are really sensitive to that endorphin. And so the effects are lasting and they last longer and you feel better. So, it, you know, your depression is, you know, you, it lowers depression and it helps with anxiety. It helps with all these things when you're, when you're sensitized to endorphin. And so it's quite possible that um, this is actually why the sauna was able to help me deal with my anxiety and help me to deal with um, stress and made me feel really good. But in addition to affecting the brain, the sauna also appears to affect overall longevity. So this was actually a study that came out of um, the University of Eastern Finland. And the study followed around 2,000 middle-aged Finnish men that were using the sauna frequently. Um, and the study followed them for 20 years and measured who died of you know, any sort of non-accidental death. So people that died from cardiovascular-related diseases, people that died from cancer or neurodegenerative diseases, uh, respiratory diseases. So all these diseases were measured um, and, and followed. These men were followed for 20 years. And what this study found was that men that used the sauna two to three times a week, so that's indicated here in red, they were 27% less likely to die from car any cardiovascular-related disease compared to men that use this on a one time a week. Men that use this on a four to seven times a week, which is indicated in black, they were 50% less likely to die from cardiovascular-related diseases throughout the 20-year period compared to men that only use this on a one time a week. So there was a dose-dependent effect that was uh, improving cardiovascular health and causing these men that were using the sauna more frequently to you know, uh, be healthier and to die less of, or be less likely to die of cardiovascular disease in that 20-year time span. Well, it turns out not just sauna frequency was important, but also the duration of time spent in the sauna. So those same men that, were, that stayed in the sauna for greater than 19 minutes, so that's indicated here in black, they had the most robust effect on lowering cardiovascular-related mortality compared to men that only use the sauna um, less than 11 minutes. So both the frequency and duration of sauna was very important for lowering cardiovascular risk. Um, there are a variety of different mechanisms that have also been um, put out there for why using the sauna can lower cardiovascular-related mortality. Uh, chiefly among them is the sauna in some ways mimics cardiovascular exercise. So when you sit in the sauna, in a hot sauna, your heart rate elevates to 100 to 150 beats per minute, which really is equivalent to moderate intensity physical exercise. Also, plasma volume expands and increases and blood flow increases to the heart. And this lowers cardiovascular strain. So your heart has to do less work for each beat that it's pumping blood you know, throughout your body to, de to uh, deliver oxygen to your tissues. So it's lowering cardiovascular strain. It's been shown to lower blood pressure, improve endothelial cell function. Endothelial cells line your blood vessels. It's been shown to um, increase and improve uh, left ventricular function. So lots of different things that the sauna has been shown to improve uh, in terms of cardiovascular risk factors. Well, it turns out cardiovascular disease was not the only thing that the sauna um, lowered the mortality rate for. It turned out that all these other non-accidental deaths were also lowered. So men that used the sauna two to three times a week had a 24% lower all-cause mortality than men that used the sauna only one time a week. Men that used the sauna four to seven times a week were 40% less likely to die of cancer, cardiovascular disease, neurodegenerative disease, respiratory diseases, and all these other non-accidental diseases that 
you know, people come down with with age. So this is very interesting, but before I get into the potential mechanisms, I want to point out that this study also measured a variety of different parameters that may affect the data, so confounding factors, they're called. So they measured you know, the physical activity of people, their, their uh, percent body fat, um, their smoke, if they smoked or drank a lot of alcohol, their socioeconomic status. So all, all those things were considered when they, when they were analyzing this data. So this data really is reflective of sauna use. But it, the, the th interesting thing is, these men were 40% less likely to die of all these diseases. Why is that? Like, why, what is this sauna doing? How is it affecting overall longevity? So to understand that, we're going to have to turn to some animal studies and look at other molecular mechanisms where we know that heat has shown to affect longevity. Chiefly among them are heat shock proteins. So heat shock proteins, as their name implies, are activated um, by heat. Uh, they're often referred to as HSPs, and they play a very important role inside of cells. They their, their role is to make sure that proteins maintain their three-dimensional structure. And that's really important because every protein inside your cell has a certain three-dimensional structure in space. And that three-dimensional structure is essential for that protein's normal function. And if you disrupt that three-dimensional structure, the protein can't function optimally. So for example, all your metabolic enzymes are specialized proteins. Their three-dimensional structures are disrupted. They're not going to be working optimally. But that's not the only thing that's important or the only reason why the three-dimensional structure is important. Um, the three-dimensional structure protein is getting damaged all the time. So just normal existence <laughs> Uh, is damaging proteins in our body all the time. Every time we breathe in oxygen and we're eating food and our mitochondria are trying to couple those together to generate energy, well, that generation of energy is really damaging because it also makes reactive byproducts that damage the proteins inside of our cell. And when they damage the proteins, the proteins become misfolded. They're not, their three-dimensional structure is screwed up. And when they become misfolded, this disrupts the protein half-life. And what this ends up doing is that protein just kind of sits around inside of the cell longer than it's supposed to. It's usually supposed to get, you know, be gotten rid of sooner. And when it sits around inside of the cell, it starts to aggregate with other proteins that have been misfolded. So as we age, we start to get these protein aggregates that are accumulate inside of our cells, outside of our cells, that happens in our brain. Amyloid beta is probably one of the, you know, key, uh, protein aggregates that people are familiar with that, play a role, that plays a role in um, brain aging as well as Alzheimer's disease. So these protein aggregates, you know, they disrupt all sorts of things and they're really, really bad and they lead to neurodegenerative diseases. Also, they play a role in cardiovascular disease. So the role that HSPs or heat shock proteins, which are activated by heat, um, is really important because when you have that protein that's damaged, the heat shock proteins can repair that damage and they can make the protein fold back to its normal three-dimensional structure. And this allows for you know, the protein not to form aggregates. Um, and that's why heat shock proteins have been shown in many, many, many different studies in animals, um, you know, in, in lower organisms to prevent Alzheimer's-like diseases, Parkinson's disease, um, and also cardiovascular disease. So heat shock proteins are very important. Just sort of as a proof of principle here, um, there's been a couple of studies that have looked at fly, fruit flies and worms. Um, these are lower organisms that, kind of like Temu was talking about, the tardigrade. They sh we, these organisms actually share a lot of uh, human DNA. So Drosophila have 40% of these fruit fly um, genes are found in humans, which is quite a bit. So if you take a fly and you get, expose it to one single exposure of heat for 70 minutes, it extends their lifespan by 15%. Also, that was shown to be de dependent on heat shock proteins because they have a version of heat shock proteins. Um, heat shock proteins have also been associated with human longevity. So humans that have a variation in a, the, a gene that makes heat shock proteins uh, live, have exceptional longevity. But there's actually another pathway that's activated by heat, uh, a longevity pathway, and that's FOXO3. So FOXO3 is a gene that is a master regulator of many other genes because it activates those genes and it deactivates those genes. Um, many of the genes that it's regulating have to do with stress resistance, have to do with being able to handle stress. 
Uh, and what do I mean by stress? I mean that same damage I was talking about. So just you know, the normal damage that we're being exposed to every day, not even to mention the damage we're exposed to for, from external factors like you know, benzene from air pollution and other carcinogens that we're exposed to. That's also damaging um, things in our body. But that same damage that damages proteins damages our DNA. And when it damages our DNA, that can potentially lead to mutations that could lead to cancer. Well, FOXO3 activates genes that are involved in DNA repair, that repair that damage before it ever can form a mutation. Additionally, FOXO3 activates genes that are involved in cell death. So if a cell does get a mutation that could potentially lead to cancer, the cell will sacrifice itself and it will die. So, you know, it's a, it's a protective mechanism against cancer. That same damage that damages proteins, that damages DNA, also damages cells. And when the cell accumulates enough damage, as we age, it accumulates more and more damage, that cell eventually becomes what's called senescent. And senescent cells aren't cells that are, they're not alive, but they're not dead. They're kind of just sitting around inside of a tissue or an, or an organ, and they're secreting these pro-inflammatory molecules and cytokines that are damaging other nearby cells, accelerating the aging process and causing them to become senescent. So it's really bad. Well, FOXO3 activates genes, antioxidant genes, that prevent that damage from ever hitting the cell. They also, uh, FOXO3 activates genes that, if the cell does become senescent and is damaged, genes that are involved in um, autophagy and clearing away that damage. But just to kind of highlight how important the uh, autophagy process is in clearing away senescent cells, there was a recent study in mice. Uh, mice also accumulate senescent cells as they age. And they were given a chemical compound that any time a senescent cell cropped up in one of their organs, it got rid of that senescent cell. And that extended the lifespan of the mice by 20%. So they actually lived 20% longer than their normal average lifespan. So senescent cells are definitely accelerating the aging process. And anything you can do to get rid of senescent cells or prevent them uh, is going to positively affect aging. So FOXO3 also activates genes that are involved in stem cell function. Uh, stem cells are very important because they replace all the other cell types in our tissues. For example, they make more white blood cells. We lose white blood cells as we age and we become more susceptible to infections and respiratory diseases as we get older. Um, stem cells also make more stem cells, which is good because we lose stem cells as we age as well. And we want to keep replenishing our organs. We want to keep replenishing the cells in each of our organs um, so that they keep maintaining the function of whatever they're supposed to do. So FOXO3 activates those genes as well. It's pretty, it's pretty badass. But if you're not convinced yet, I'm going to show you one of, uh, some, a study that's actually my early work um, at, when I was a young scientist at the Salk Institute. It's actually one of the first uh, biology experiments I did and really got me hooked on biology. So this worm here is um, it's a C. elegant worm, and it lives on average about 15 days of lifespan. It has around uh, it shares about 60% you know, of its genes are found in humans. Um, it has a version of the FOXO3 gene. So this worm has been genetically engineered to express human amyloid beta-42, that toxic peptide that aggregates and forms plaques and brains of people as they age and plays a role in Alzheimer's disease. It's been, it's been engineered to express it in its muscle tissue, lower muscle tissue. So as it ages, the amyloid plaques aggregate in its muscle tissue and it can't move, it becomes paralyzed. So I guess if you watch this video, let's go back because it, okay. So you watch the video, whoops. One second here, I press something. Okay, so let's see if I can play this. See, it's not moving its lower body, it's just moving its nose around. That, that worm right there is 12 days old, so it's at the end of its lifespan. So the next worm I'm going to show you uh, is the same age as that worm. It's also been genetically engineered to have amyloid beta plaques in its muscle tissue to get paralyzed. The only difference is, is that it has also been genetically manipulated to have FOXO3 gene active all the time. So you can see it moving around just fine. Same age as the other worm, day 12. So, the only difference was that FOXO3 gene prevented those aggregates from you know, accumulating in its muscle tissue and causing it to become paralyzed. So it aged much, much better um, than the other worm. And if you're not convinced with worm longevity, 
then perhaps you'll be convinced with uh, human longevity. So the FOXO3 GA, the FOXO3 A gene has been associated with human longevity. So we're, we all have uh, different variations of the same gene. So we have the same genes, but different variations of these genes. Uh, it's what give people, you know, blue eyes versus brown eyes. Well, some people have a version of FOXO3 A that makes it active all the time. So it's, you know, it's always activating these antioxidant genes, it's activating autophagy genes, it's activating stem cell function genes, it's act activating DNA repair genes. So these genes are constantly being activated. And so people that have that are able to deal with all sorts of damage so much better because they can just repair it constantly. Well, those people are 2.7 times more likely to become a centenarian, to live to be 100, which is pretty uh, impressive. So in summary, when we're talking about the sauna and, and longevity, the sauna sensitizes the brain to endorphin, and uh, it does that by increasing dynorphin, which makes you feel uncomfortable, and uh, as a consequence, you feel better because you become sensitive to the feel-good endorphin. It improves car cardiovascular function. Um, it's been associated with lower, all, it's been associated with lower cardiovascular rate of mortality, uh, it improves uh, cardiovascular function by lowering cardiovascular strain. It also improves overall longevity, possibly by many different mechanisms, activating heat shock proteins, which are important for ma maintaining the proper three-dimensional structure of proteins inside of our cells, and also by activating the FOXO3 gene, which is doing so much cool shit that's like really, really good and really important for the way we age. Um, one other thing that I want to mention that uh, I didn't get into, it also increases growth hormone by like two to three fold. Sometimes in cases, um, if, you, if you do multiple sauna treatments, it can increase growth hormone by up to 16 fold. Um, and growth hormone plays a very important role in many things, but um, improving repair of muscle damage is one thing that it's uh, important for. But I want to switch gears just for a minute here and talk a little bit about another type of stress or another type of hormetic stress, uh, and that is cold stress, which um, I, th I think you guys in Finland are also very accustomed to jumping in cold water as well. There's many different modalities for cold stress, jumping into a cold lake, taking a cold shower, jumping into an ice bath, walking around in the cool air in the winter, um, going into a cryotherapy chamber. These are all methods that can um, cold stress our body. And cold stress, much like heat stress, is a type of hormetic stress that activates all these genetic pathways that help us deal with stress. Probably one of the most robust uh, responses to cold stress that I have seen in the literature um, is the robust increase in norepinephrine in the locus coeruleus region of the brain. Norepinephrine in the brain plays a very important role in focus and attention uh, and vigilance, also in mood so it makes you feel better. Norepinephrine is uh, something that's actually pharmacologically targeted quite often, so it's used to treat depression and also ADHD, um, but it can be released by cold shocking the body. Um, sorry, that slide. What kind of temperature we, temperatures are we talking about here? Well, we're talking about uh, people, people that were walking around in 16 degrees Celsius air you know, temperature for six hours, increase their norepinephrine by 260%. Um, you don't have to spend that much time in the cold to get a norepinephrine increase. Uh, people that submerge themselves in 4.4 degrees Celsius water um, for 20 seconds were able to increase their norepinephrine by 200 to 300%. So the colder the water, the more robust the norepinephrine release. Uh, but also duration as well. So if you're if you're not if you're in less cooler water, then you don't have to stay in as long, for example. Uh, but these things have all been shown to be very robust in releasing norepinephrine. Something else very cool about norepinephrine, you know, in addition to being a neurotransmitter, it actually acts as a hormone as well, um, and it, we also release it in our body uh, because it causes vasoconstriction, and that's one of the mechanisms that we use to conserve heat when we're cold. Uh, so. Another mechanism that, we're, that we use to generate heat is also related to norepinephrine, and that has to do with increasing mitochondrial biogenesis in your adipose tissue and in your muscle tissue. So mitochondrial biogenesis means new mitochondria. So this is an electron micrograph that I took uh, several years ago of a fibroblast cell, which is not an adipose 
cell, but I just wanted to show you mitochondria. Um, this oval here in the center is the cell nucleus, and all these like bean-like structures around it are mitochondria. And those mitochondria are the energy-producing units inside of our cells. That's, they're what makes energy in our cells. Well, these, these mitochondria are... The mitochondrial biogenesis occurs with cold exposure. You can think about it, it makes perfect sense because as you generate energy, as a byproduct, you generate heat. And so this is an adaptive mechanism that occurs to help you warm up when you're cold. So this mitochondrial biogenesis that happens in the adipose tissue is often referred to uh, as browning of fat. And the reason for that is because if you look here at the mitochondria, this, this is a black and white micrograph, but the mitochondria are like darker in color. So you can imagine when you have more of these in adipose tissue, which is white, it appears to look beige or brown. So it's a little browning color. Um, also, as you have more mitochondria in your fat, because fat is, you know, it's where, where you're storing the most energy, uh, you start to burn that fat because the mitochondria are trying really hard to make heat because they want you to not die. They want you to, you know, to warm up. Uh, you, the, the side effect is that you actually burn fat, and so a lot of people like that as a you know, potential mechanism to treat obesity. This is all regulated by norepinephrine. So that's very interesting because I just talked about norepinephrine and how it regulates mood, focus, tension. I mean, it makes you feel good, um, helps with anxiety, but it also appears to regulate this process because if you block the, in, the brain's ability to respond to norepinephrine, then mitochondrial biogenesis does not occur upon cold exposure in adipose tissue. So that norepinephrine is very important for that. What kind of temperatures are we talking about for mitochondrial biogenesis? Well, those same humans that were walking around in 16 degrees Celsius weather for six hours that had a 260% increase in norepinephrine experienced a 37% increase in browning of their adipose tissue. So they're able to brown their fat after walking around in 16 degrees Celsius weather, cool-ish weather, for six hours. Adipose tissue is not the only tissue that mitochondrial biogenesis occurs. It also happens in muscle tissue. And this is another electron micrograph I took. It's a little closer up. Uh, it's not muscle. But you can see the mitochondria are, they come in different shapes and sizes. And uh, the ones that are longer, that's actually two mitochondria fusing together, exchanging all their mitochondrial DNA and all their mitochondrial content. And the ones that are like oval shaped are ones that have actually broken apart after they've exchanged all their content. It's really elegant how mitochondria can repair damage by doing this process, but it's sort of a side tangent. Um, the mitochondrial biogenesis also occurs in muscle tissue. That is not regulated by norepinephrine. That's regulated by another pathway. But it has been shown to be uh, very robust. It activates something called PGC1-alpha. And um, what's interesting is that if you think about mitochondria, they're what allow us to use oxygen for energy. So if, you're, if you have more mitochondria in your muscle tissue, then you're going to be able to uh, more effectively use oxygen. And this uh, is why it, mitochondrial biogenesis in muscle tissue has been shown to improve aerobic capacity, uh, which you know, is, uses oxygen. Uh, so, peop so men that actually submerge their legs in, uh, I think it was about 10 degrees Celsius water for uh, 10 minutes, they had experienced massive mitochondrial biogenesis or muscle tissue. Uh, and it's also, the cold exposure has also been shown to improve in very, you know, preliminary studies to improve endurance uh, in some athletes, including runners and uh, cyclists and tennis players. So there's this, you know, the ongoing study looking at how cold exposure may actually enhance endurance uh, performance because of this mitochondrial biogenesis, among other things. It also reduces inflammation and helps with recovery time. So uh, lots of interesting stuff we've talked about today. Um, we talked about how the sauna affects cardiovascular you know, function, how it affects overall longevity, how it affects the brain, how it sensitizes the brain to endorphins. We talked about how it activates FOXO3 and how FOXO3 is a really, really important stress response genetic pathway that activates all these other amazing genes that help us deal with all the damage that we're constantly being exposed to and how it's involved in longevity. We talked about you know, cold exposure and how it's important for norepinephrine, how norepinephrine helps you focus, it helps you um, feel good, and also helps with anxiety as well. And 
it causes the, the production of new mitochondria, both in your adipose tissue, and cold uh, causes the production of new mitochondria in your muscle tissue, and how that may play a role in endurance. So lots of interesting science going on in this field. But I, what I think many of you actually may be asking yourself is, what about going from the hot sauna into the cold water? Does you know, going into the cold water after the hot sauna negate any of those effects? And the shorter answer is, I don't know. There's not really any empirical evidence that I have seen that suggests anything, because no one's really looking at that. But I do know that going from a hot sauna into the cold water causes norepinephrine to be increased even more than either alone. Uh, so that's good. It, it implies there may be some synergistic effect. And I also know that cold shocking the body with cold water, whatever modality you're using, um, also activates heat shock proteins. Not as robustly as heat does, but the fact that it activates the same genetic pathway that heat does, uh, I think is good because I, it gives us hope that maybe these two things in combination are synergistically acting together and are improving overall longevi longevity through similar uh, mechanisms. But I know personally from doing it, it also just makes you feel really, really good. And I think that uh, accounts for something. So with that, I will leave you with a slide of me on my sunny California beach um, and uh, to taunt you and say thank you. So I guess I can take some questions. Yes. I always repeat the question, but we'll wait for the microphone. <laughs> it's not on. The mic's not on. Oh, okay. So the question, I think, is when combining sauna with exercise, is there a certain protocol that before or after, okay. So the question is, if you are doing exercise, you know, I guess aerobic or strength training, I'm not sure what type of exercise, and you're doing the sauna, like, is it better to do the sauna before you do the exercise or is it better to do the sauna after exercise? And if you're asking me if there's empirical evidence showing either, uh, no, I haven't seen any that's showing, but from personal experience, I prefer to do the sauna after exercise uh, because one, the sauna is also, uh, exhausting. So if I try to do the sauna before I work out, my workout won't be as good. Um, and also, I think that, you know, after the workout, I like doing it because it's increasing the growth hormone and IGF-1. And so these things are, you know, right after you're working out, it's, it's helping repair that some of that damage that's been done from the workout too. So, but I don't, there's no empirical evidence to say what's the best protocol. Yes. I think I'm, I'm the next here. Hello. Oh, she's looking at me. Sorry, <laughs> I'm here. So the question I think is, uh, what are what are my thoughts on doing cold after? So the question is, what are my thoughts are on doing the uh, cold shocking the body? So going into a cold bath or ice bath after doing um, aerobic exercise versus strength training exercise where you're lifting weights. Um, and it's a really good question because there's been a lot of dif differences and conflicting evidence in the scientific literature showing that doing cold water immersion, for example, um, immediately after endurance exercise appears to improve the endurance exercise. And, and that's partly because one, mitochondrial biogenesis is, is immediately occurring in muscle tissue, so you're improving aerobic capacity. So if you're, if you're doing that and then you immediately engage endurance exercise again, you know, studies have shown there's some endurance enhancements. Um, also, it reduces inflammation, and so when you're doing endurance type of training, that also can help if you reduce your inflammation, that can improve your performance as well. However, when you're doing strength training, if you're lifting weights, um, something that you're wanting to cause muscle hypertrophy, then it's been shown doing cold water immersion immediately after that um, is not good because 
uh, immediately after strength training, there's inflammation that's, that occurs, and that inflammation is very important to, as a hormetic response to activate all these anti-inflammatory pathways, and also um, it's important to um, activate some immune cells that play a role in producing IGF-1 and muscle tissue, which helps you, you know, make your muscle grow. Basically, it helps you with hypertrophy. So uh, doing cold water immersion within an hour after strength training is, um, has been shown to be deleterious on muscle hypertrophy. So. Do we not have a functional mic? Okay. Microphone here, sorry. So I'll try. So the question is, is there any difference in how a person breathes, their breathing, you know, the, the way they're breathing in the sauna, and if that affects some of the hormone production, if that affects some of these other, you know, neurotransmitter and, and things that are being activated by breathing. So uh, the answer is, I haven't seen any studies doing that sort of breathing in the sauna to, you know, actually, you know, affect, affect that. But you know, you know, changing, doing hyperventilation and things that can cause a slight hypoxia have been shown to affect epinephrine release, also norepinephrine. So independent of the sauna, they are also affecting neurotransmitters and also hormones. Doing it in the sauna, I'm, I'm not sure. Um, right, the air is different. OK. We can have a question in the back now. The microphone is working, I'm told. Yes, hello. Nice yes, meeting. hello. Thank you uh, for your presentation. I would like to ask, um, uh, what is the case if a person is, um, um, has got like cold and heat intolerance, like in the case of fibromyalgia? So are there any genetic SNPs that one should uh, check in, in the case of uh, heat and uh, cold intolerance, like in the cases of fibromyalgia? Um, I, th I heard some of the question. I think that you're asking in the case of fibromyalgia, yes, if there's and, any and the evidence. Because there is intolerance. Um, most often there is cold and heat intolerance. So I would like to ask, do you know anything about the genetic SNPs um, SNPs um, uh, that would uh, be altered in the case of heat and uh, cold intolerance. So I don't know about any uh, genetic polymorphisms or SNPs that play a role in fibromyalgia specifically. I'm sure there probably are some genetic polymorphisms that do, uh, but I do know that both the sauna and cold exposure have been shown to improve, and, and these studies are not very well done. I mean, there's no control group, but they, people subjectively have felt better. Their fi fibromyalgia has improved after using... What um, about the lack of copper? Because it is in, um, uh, um, it's linked to uh, this uh, cold intolerance. Do you know anything about the metabolism of copper in, uh, uh, and the link to this situation? I'm sorry, I don't know anything about the okay, copper. Thank you. Thank you. I can't. Yes. Hello. Hi. Um, is there anything you need to watch out for when you have a certain heart disease or a weak heart if you go from uh, very hot to very cold? Um, is it all healthy or do you have to watch out for some stuff? Thank you. Yeah, so that's a, a great question. It is, you know, is there any health risk involved in going from the hot to the cold? Uh, and this is something that I've been very interested in as well. You know, if you think about it, you're, you're causing vasodilation and you're increasing blood flow when you're in the sauna. And then when you go into the cold, you're doing the exact opposite. You're actually causing vasoconstriction. Um, and uh, so it's... The, I've looked in the literature and I, I found a few studies that were published showing that people that had pre-existing heart conditions, um, particularly ones that are involved with plaque production uh, in the arteries, like arterial sclerosis, atherosclerosis, um, these, these conditions may, there may be a risk, according to a few studies, with going from the hot to the cold, 
Um, but it's, it's, it's really, there's not a lot of research on that, and it's something I'm very interested in. And I'm actually going to be talking to the researcher that did the sauna study here in Finland in a couple of days, and so he's someone I'm hoping to get some answers from and also ask him if he can look, you know, future studies, he can look at that because it, I think it's a very important question that needs to be answered and we need to understand um, the health risk, potential health risks of going from hot to cold. Cool. How about a big hand for Dr. Rhonda Patrick? Thank you. Thank what you so much. What a pleasure to have you.